All right, everybody, we've made it to Wednesday. It is Wednesday, August 16th. You're listening to the Mo News Podcast. I'm Mo Shwanunu. And I am Jill Wagner. This is the place where we bring you just the facts. And we read all the news and read between the lines so you don't have to. Uh, Jill, we're on the road today. That's right. A big day for Mo News, our first White House invitation. Yes, um, we should say we, you know, we've both been at the White House uh, covering events there for other organizations. Uh, but this is the first time we have a Mo News press pass, which is very cool. Uh, we'll be down there uh, covering uh, an event this afternoon at the White House. It is the we'll get to it later in the podcast. Actually, it's the one year anniversary of a major piece of legislation. So we'll be down there. Uh, and it does come as uh, we had an interview with the National Climate Advisor for the White House. We put that out on the feed yesterday, talking all things climate change, what the White House is up to, some new legislation. Uh, so if you haven't gotten to listen to it, uh, take a listen, and uh, we'll have more coverage throughout the day on Instagram. And Moshe is being very kind to say we. Uh, the invitation actually admits one, so it's just <laughs> going to be Moshe and yours truly. will be holding down the fort in the Long Island Mo News Bureau. Yes, Jill, we're, we're, we're taking this piecemeal, <laughs> bit by bit. Um, I know we have some uh, journalists who cover the White House who listen to us. Um, and so we're working on getting a second invitation very soon. Not to worry. We're going to get you there. There is a chance my parents heard just the first part of that and are already calling me being like, what? What's going on? You're going to the White House? <laughs> Guys, nope. It's just motion for today. Jill, I hope to make you proud uh, rep representing uh, representing the brand down there. Uh, and uh, I'll report back on tomorrow's pod. All right, let's get to the headlines and an update from Maui. Recovery efforts continue, but now a new concern, real estate developers who want to buy up the destroyed properties. It is hard to keep track of all of Donald Trump's legal trouble. So we're going to do a quick breakdown of his indictments and charges and how some of this could play out. A story we told you about a while ago, well, the mother of that six-year-old boy who shot his teacher has pleaded guilty. The Inflation Reduction Act turns one, but do Americans know it exists? Short answer, most do not, Jill. Duncan is releasing boozy versions of their iced coffees and tea, what exactly they're made of and why experts think one of the drinks could be a tough sell. And Mosh, because we are trying to stay on trend here at Mo News, what is Ijbal? We'll explain. <laughs> I just learned this one a few minutes before the podcast. And Mosh, you got on this day in history. Jill, we'll talk about a former president who is calling an investigation into him a witch hunt. Uh, also, a bit of history on Sports Illustrated and some big music history on this day, including my favorite ABBA song. I'm intrigued. All right, let's start in Hawaii. As of Tuesday, at least 99 people have been confirmed dead in the Maui wildfires. It is a number that is expected to rise, given that only 25% of the burn area has been searched. The Maui police chief says crews hope to search 85 to 95 percent of the burn area by this weekend. Most of the people found dead have been out in the open, in cars or in the water. The shelters are starting to empty. Many residents have been placed into housing and the power is starting to come back on. Officials are now using the term unaccounted for instead of missing because many people on the Hawaiian island just don't have power, internet or phones and aren't able to get in touch with relatives. So about 60 people who were considered missing were actually found safe in a single house. Uh, some good news there, at least. Yeah, especially as we still have several hundred people uh, that they're looking to track down here, Jill. They have been asking people uh, to actually, if they can, change their voicemails if they can't uh, get reception. So people, when they call their voicemail, will know that they're okay, that there's been a change there. Uh, officials in Hawaii have urged tourists to avoid traveling to Maui, as many hotels will now be used to house evacuees and first responders, all of whom lost their homes as thousands of structures were destroyed. The Hawaii Tourism Authority says tourists are encouraged to visit Hawaii's other islands, 
but avoid Maui until further notice. Joel, you mentioned this in the headlines. There is now another concern. Like Maui needs other concerns as the search continues, as this uh, multi-year rebuild is going to happen. There is concern now that real estate investors and developers are already reaching out, trying to buy up what remains of Maui homes and property. Fire survivors say they're getting calls and messages on social media from real estate investors. So much so that the governor of Hawaii is now considering a temporary ban on the sale of burned properties as a way to prevent developers from trying to, quote, steal land, uh, as has been the reference in a number of videos that you might have seen on social media from Hawaii. The governor there already reaching out to the state attorney general to explore a moratorium on the sale of damaged or destroyed homes. And even before the fires wiped out hundreds of homes in Maui, the state was already dealing with an affordable housing crisis. It's in part fueled by international buyers for second and third homes uh, they're looking to vacation in or rent out, the median price of a home in Maui has soared to roughly 1.2 million. This is before the fire, while the median income on the island is just $88,000. So residents say they're worried that if insurance payouts and government assistance don't come fast enough, survivors will be forced to sell to people who will drastically change their community. Uh, saw one interview uh, yesterday, Jill, where they were worried that Lahaina, which was this you know, authentic, um, old Hawaiian village, the longtime capital of the kingdom of Hawaii back in the day, will simply reemerge as another version of Waikiki with uh, corporate-owned luxury brands packed with tourists uh, if the state isn't uh, on top of the situation. All right, let's get to the latest on the legal front for former President Trump following the latest indictment related to election interference in Georgia. Now, from election interference to hush money payments, mishandling of classified documents, there are a number of cases that we have been tracking. So we wanted to zoom out today and give you a state of play. Trump has now been indicted four times in five months. He's been indicted in two federal cases, one New York criminal case, and most recently that one Georgia criminal case. And he also faces three state civil trials within the next year. In all, he has been charged with 91 crimes between those four criminal indictments. If he is found guilty on all charges and gets the maximum sentence, which is completely unlikely, he could spend 700 years behind bars. That's just to give you a sense of all the various counts that he faces. And these all seem to blend together, but this is serious stuff. He is the first former president to ever be indicted, and in his case, several times over. So we wanted to just briefly walk through the legal cases, the charges, and how this could all play out potentially. Let's start with the most recent indictment from late on Monday. This is for the election tampering in Georgia. It is a state criminal case. He was charged with 13 counts in a racketeering case accusing him and 18 others like Rudy Giuliani of orchestrating a criminal enterprise to reverse state election results in 2020. So this case involves that infamous and potentially illegal call that President Trump made to Georgia's Republican Secretary of State, where he was saying he just needs 11,780 votes. The charges include violating the RICO Act, soliciting a public officer to violate an oath, and conspiring to impersonate a public officer. Trump has until noon next Friday to voluntarily surrender to authorities, as he has done in the other indictments. The trial date is TBD, although the prosecutor there, Fawny Willis, says that she would like to start trying the case in the next six months. So, Mosh, this was the big breaking news Monday night. Yeah, this is the fourth and final indictment uh, that we were expecting here, or potentially expecting, but it, it did come down for Trump and the 18 others. There's already been a lot of reaction in the first 24 hours. Uh, several of the folks indicted alongside him, and this could potentially include Trump at some point, want to move the case to federal court. At least they're going to petition to do so. That includes Rudy Giuliani. That includes the former White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, who faces three counts. By the way, Rudy faces 13 counts as his attorney down there. Uh, they say they were working for a federal official named Donald Trump at the time, and believe that uh, this falls under what's called the supremacy clause of the Constitution, which means that a state should not be able to interfere with a federal official's duties. Legal experts are split on this. Uh, some have argued that the transfer in these circumstances is not appropriate because interfering with the results of an election does not count as conduct within an official's, within an officer's 
within an officer's official duties. It'll remain to be so. It remains to be seen uh, if that works out for them. That certainly is something Trump may try because keep in mind he's hoping to be president again. And guess what? If it's a federal trial, he can potentially pardon himself, pardon the others, or be pardoned by another Republican if they're elected. Giuliani out there doing interviews, uh, saying on Tuesday. Quote, we're going to beat these fascists into the ground in response to uh, the DA there in Georgia. Trump calling this a political witch hunt, a term he likes to use for all of these cases. He says he's innocent and he plans to do a presentation at 11 a.m. next Monday, mark your calendars, at his golf club in New Jersey, showing why he is innocent. He put exoneration, he put the word exoneration in all caps, uh, saying that's what he will prove. So stay tuned for that. The governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp, a Republican, not having any of it. He, by the way, was one of the people pushing back on Trump two years ago, saying, man, you lost fair and square. He says, reiterated again on Tuesday, the election was legitimate and Trump will have to continue to make his arguments about a faulty, fraudulent election in his own criminal trial. We should note, by the way, the governor of Georgia does not have pardoning power. There's a pardoning commission in Georgia. So that makes this trial problematic. Should Trump or any of the others be found guilty? Uh, the rule in Georgia, typically, you can't apply for a pardon until five years after you've served your sentence. So that's something to keep in mind here and why they definitely want to get this case out of Georgia. This all follows that two and a half year investigation you mentioned. Jill, you mentioned the RICO Act. That was initially a federal law that was passed to combat organized crime like the mafia, but has recently been used for white collar crime, political corruption cases, including in Georgia. So we'll be watching that. So that's the Georgia indictment. Let's work backwards here. Most recently, he was also indicted for election interference on the federal level. That's from Special Prosecutor Jack Smith. Smith charged Trump with four counts related to overturning the 2020 election federally, leading to the insurrection on January 6th. Trump has pled not guilty to those charges. They've proposed a trial date of January 2nd next year. And you're going to see here that the calendar is filling up for Trump. Then there's the other federal case that Jack Smith is the special counsel for. That's the indictment that he'll be trying in Florida. That's related to 40 federal counts, 40 crimes related to storing classified documents, and then obstructing the FBI and authorities and the National Archives from getting them back, including lying to officials, etc. Trump has pled not guilty in that case. That's expected to go to trial in May. And that takes us back to the first criminal indictment back in the spring, the Stormy Daniels hush money case. Moshe, I feel like that was another lifetime ago. <laughs> five months. <laughs> Feels like five years. Yes. Um, so this is a state criminal case in New York. It was brought by Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg. He charged Trump with 34 felony counts for falsifying business records. This was related to reimbursing his former attorney for hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels. The alleged goal, keep her quiet about that alleged affair with Trump ahead of the 2016 presidential election. Trump has pleaded not guilty in that case as well. The expected trial date there, March 25th of next year. And then there are three civil cases. The New York Attorney General seeking $250 million in penalties and to permanently bar the Trumps from operating a business in the state. They're alleging that Trump committed fraud by inflating his net worth by billions of dollars in order to attract better loan and tax agreements. And then there's E. Jean Carroll and her defamation case. This is, again, another civil case. Trump was already found liable for sexual assault and defamation back in May. But you might remember following her victory, Trump had that CNN town hall. He also wrote on social media negative things about her. So she has subsequently asked the court to expand the scope of the first case. And now she's seeking $10 million additionally in defamation damages. And then there is also another civil case. This has to do with this alleged pyramid scheme. Investors say they lost hundreds of thousands of dollars investing with this telecom company that turned out to be a pyramid scheme. The Trump family had promoted it on the TV show The Apprentice and at conventions. Moshe, it's a lot. President Trump has called it all a witch hunt. And ironically, he says it's election interference because he is currently the Republican frontrunner for the 2024 presidential election. And a lot of these trials are scheduled for right smack in the middle of the campaign. I know a few people, though, have been asking you about the timing of this on the Instagram account. Basically, why are all of these indictments coming now? 
So they're, they feel like they're all coming at the same time, but they all have different chronologies and trajectories, some very short, some very long. Uh, Trump allies, though, even independent observers say this feels like a lot. This is all intentional, coordinated to make him lose. Well, let's take it bit by bit here. The New York case, the uh, hush money Stormy Daniels case, that's from 2016. But the Trump Justice Department put obstacles and basically quashed it for four years while he was president. That's according to the DA in New York, Cy Vance, who didn't pursue charges. So that effectually, so that effectively froze it for a while. Then Trump wouldn't turn over his tax returns for a couple of years until they finally got a hold of them. That's almost six years in. And then the new DA in New York, Alvin Bragg, decides to uh, pursue that case. So that's that case. As far as the two federal cases, the classified documents case, well, that has to do with actions Trump took after he was president, right? He took the classified documents home with him in 2021, uh, refused to give them back. 2022, from the FBI, has a search warrant, summer 2022, that's last summer. Jack Smith takes on the case in the fall, indicts within six months or so in that case. That's actually a pretty quick prosecution. The other one Jack Smith took on, the January 6th case, sort of languished in the Justice Department for a year and a half, not really dealt with by the Attorney General Merrick Garland. Maybe there was reluctance to indict the former president, whatever. It goes to the special counsel. The special counsel, by the way, at that point, just got a new report from the January 6th committee. So he had that sort of ready to go. Again, he indicts that within eight months. And finally, you have the Georgia case, two and a half years. That's the longest running when it comes to the election interference cases. Remember, Smith got his done in eight months. This is two and a half years. Fonnie, Fonnie Willis, the DA, says she did face obstacles, people refusing to testify, had to go to federal court to get people like Mark Meadows to testify, Lindsey Graham to testify, et cetera. I have heard from prosecutors who do say that Fonnie probably took too much time with it, but you know she feels that she needed to for a RICO case, 51 crimes, 19 individuals. And so you have sort of all of them coming out within a five-month period all for different reasons. Now, keep in mind, the election is next year. So um, one of the theories as to why Trump announced so early, remember he announced last November, was so he could be an active candidate when they announced this. So he sort of cooked it. So, you know, he's like, you're interfering with my campaign. He also happened to announce two years before the election that he was running for president. So that is part of it. But Jill, either way, uh, regardless, um, it does make for a jam-packed schedule here. All these cases starting in October, you have that civil case. And then basically every four to six weeks, one of these cases is currently set to be heard or they're trying to hear them. January alone looks like they could begin three or four cases. And now keep in mind, Trump's also running for president, running for primaries, caucuses, but he's going to have to be in court for a number of these cases. So even these judges will now have to be calling each other, being like, when are you hearing your case? When are you scheduling stuff? Because I have a Trump case. You have a Trump case. You have a Trump case. The only place you currently have some ease is two of the cases are Jack Smith cases, the federal cases, classified documents and election interference. And he can sort of decide himself, I'm going to pause on this case uh, or I'm going to go ahead with the other case, depending on what he feels is stronger. Uh, also, keep in mind, he, Trump's trying to be president again. So a lot of these people want to get this case in before he's president again and potentially could kill the case. Look, I know Trump talks a big game. He calls it a witch hunt. Uh, and he has been able to raise a lot of money off of, of these indictments. But you've got to imagine just on a human level that this is weighing on him. Oh, it's it's got to be exhausting. And by the way, very costly, right? We already know that his campaign as of June spent more than $40 million. This is all campaign donations, by the way. If you donate to the Trump campaign, uh, there's a chance that your money is going towards his lawyers. He has dozens of attorneys across seven cases. Uh, and I mean, it's got to be stressful for a 77-year-old man running for president uh, to deal with all this, though at the same time, publicly, he feels energized by this. And at least so far, Jill, it does not seem to be impacting him negatively in the Republican primary campaign. In fact, it seems to be bolstering support for him. Again, I'm hearing from people on the Instagram account who say, you know, this feels unfair to him. I might consider him because I feel he's being treated unfairly here. So it's very interesting uh, to be monitoring this because, again, you know, we've always been following two tracks in this case, right? The legal track and the politics track and how the legal impacts the politics. All right, time now for the speed read from CBS News. The mother of a six-year-old boy who authorities say used her gun to shoot his teacher at a Virginia elementary school in January pleaded guilty Tuesday to a state charge stemming from the shooting, according to the AP. Deja Taylor pleaded guilty to felony child neglect in a Newport News courtroom 
Taylor is 26 years old. She was charged back in April with child neglect and recklessly leaving a loaded firearm so as to endanger a child. It is a misdemeanor, but prosecutors dropped the misdemeanor count in a plea agreement. Taylor had told police that she normally stored the gun in her purse with a trigger lock in place or in a lockbox. And on the morning of the shooting, she thought the gun was in her purse on top of her dresser in her bedroom. This is according to police. She said she had kept the key for the trigger lock under her mattress. Now, in a federal case stemming from the shooting, investigators said they couldn't find a trigger lock or a lock box during searches of Taylor's home or her mother's home. A prosecutor said during Tuesday's hearing that the boy told authorities he climbed onto a dresser drawer to get the gun from Taylor's purse. Prosecutors said they won't seek a greater sentence than what sentencing guidelines call for, which would be six months in jail or prison. In April, her attorney said that her client had experienced miscarriages and postpartum depression before that January incident. The attorney said Tuesday that the boy's great grandfather was now taking care of him. So the mom here will be sentenced for federal charges in October. Some background here. The boy shot his teacher. Her name was Abby Zwerner with the nine millimeter handgun in their classroom after a recess on January 6th earlier this year. Zwerner told investigators that the boy pulled a gun out of his jacket and pointed it right at her. When she asked what he was doing, that's when he fired the shot. She was hit in the left hand and upper torso. And yet, despite that, was able to uh, help all of the rest of the kids in her classroom flee the situation. A reading specialist with the school then went inside, saw the boy and the gun nearby on the floor and held the boy in place until the police arrived. He had told that woman, by the way, I got my mom's gun last night, saying he intentionally shot the first grade teacher. He was already under a care plan that included a family member accompanying him to class every day. The week of the shooting was the first time a parent was not in class with him. By the way, that teacher, Abby Zwerner, she has a $40 million lawsuit out against the school, accusing the school of gross negligence for failing to respond aggressively to multiple warnings she had that the kid was talking about guns, bringing a gun to school, and then that day had concerns that he had a gun. Just a sad story all around here, Jill. From the Hill, today marks one year since the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act a major part of the Biden administration's efforts to pull the country out of its pandemic era slowdown. President Biden spoke on Tuesday in Milwaukee at an event highlighting what the White House argues is a strong, rebounding U.S. economy. Recent polls, though, indicate that many voters are unaware of the programs contained within the act, which range from supporting the green energy sector to setting a price cap on insulin. Last week, Biden himself expressed second thoughts about the name of the 2022 legislation, saying that the measures in the package were about a broad slate of economic goals beyond just curbing inflation. Republicans, meanwhile, say the act was misguided from the beginning. And Mosh, again, the White House inviting you to D.C. today to cover this one year anniversary. Yeah, we'll see what they stress there um, at the event. Uh, we'll have coverage all day on the Instagram account. It's interesting because when it was passed last year, all Democrats in Congress voted for it. All Republicans opposed it. I, that was also when we were experiencing 9% inflation. So something called the Inflation Reduction Act felt like the right name, at least last year. Uh, the interview that's out right now in the podcast feed, it'll be the most recent podcast just before this episode, is with National Climate Advisor Ali Zaidi. You mentioned that several components of the Inflation Reduction Act had to do with clean energy, climate, uh, bringing battery plants here to the U.S., bringing chip plants here to the U.S., reshoring um, technology here that's going to be key to clean energy, also tax rebates for electric cars and adopting clean energy at home. So those are among the things they want to remind taxpayers uh, about. Jill, in the podcast, we also talk about how they're looking to make electric cars more affordable, electric charging, and the various other initiatives. Though we should note, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act does have its critics. Uh, there have been third-party reports, including by banks like Goldman Sachs, that say that it sets out very ambitious targets, but we need hundreds of thousands more engineers and construction workers in this country to be able to make good on some of the spending in the bill. Also, that some of the spending that says it's going to be tens of billions or hundreds of billions might reach a trillion dollars. And so there are questions as to the impact this will eventually have um, on our uh, deficit um, in this country and the overall uh, national debt.
Mosh, whatever you hear tomorrow from Biden and his team will probably be a, a good foreshadowing of what we can expect throughout the election season on how they're going to be kind of spinning their economic policies. So it'll definitely be insightful for sure. From the Washington Post, North Korea early Wednesday confirming that they are holding a U.S. soldier who fled into its territory across the heavily fortified border last month. It is the first time that North Korea has publicly acknowledged the status of private second class Travis King, who bolted into the North during a civilian tour of the DMZ last month. North Korea claims that King told them he ran across because he was disillusioned with the, quote, unequal American society. They claim he was escaping, quote, inhumane maltreatment and racial discrimination within the U.S. Army. He also expressed his willingness to seek refuge in North Korea or a third country. So the U.S. officials have so far said that the North has not provided substantive responses to their requests for information on King. Keep in mind, typically we're used to the North Koreans uh, reacting pretty quickly to something like that, and they've kept silent here for several weeks. The Pentagon says they cannot verify any of King's comments as reported by Kim Jong-un's state news agency there, though they do remain focused on his safe return. How to classify Travis King, who by the way is 23 years old, remains a question. Typically we would call him a POW, a prisoner of war, since we do have a state of war with the North, but factors including King's decision to willingly cross into North Korea with his own free will, of his own free will, in civilian attire appear to have disqualified him from POW status. Background here, he joined the military about two and a half years ago, was in South Korea where we have tens of thousands of troops, but got himself into some legal issues. He faced two allegations of assault in South Korea, eventually pleaded guilty to assault and destroying public property for damaging a police car during a chai raid against Koreans recently. He served some time there. He was due for more disciplinary measures here in the US. They took him to the airport. He somehow escaped the airport, made it to that tour of the DMZ, and then bolted across the border. This is a story uh, we'll continue to stay on top of, but it appears the information continues to be murky, and we're frankly depending on the North Koreans to tell us what's going on, which is always challenging in the least. From CNN Business, it is true. Dunkin' is turning two of its most popular drinks into boozy beverages, The brand made it official this week, announcing the debut of Dunkin' Spiked Iced Coffees and Iced Teas. Both are scheduled to roll out in the coming weeks. There are eight flavors, all based on the chain's iced coffee and tea flavors. As for the booze part, they are flavored malt beverages, which means that the source of the alcohol is a fermented base, primarily from sugar. The iced coffee contains 6% alcohol by volume. The iced tea has 5% alcohol. Duncan is joining a crowded field of soft drinks going hard, part of this growing trend of ready-to-drink beverages, hitting shelves as consumers crave new combinations of their favorite flavors. Sales of RTDs, or ready-to-drink beverages, amass more than $10 billion in U.S. sales over the past year. That is a 7% increase from the prior year. Duncan's president telling CNN the creation of Duncan Spiked means that, quote, you can start and end your day with Duncan. Speak for yourselves. Those spiked coffees sound sound perfect for breakfast. (laughs) Right. Presumably he means, Jill, the non-spiked for breakfast, the spiked uh, after you finish your day and put your kids to bed. Pricing has yet to be released. They will not be sold, by the way, at Duncan locations because of alcohol laws. So at launch, you can find them in 12 states, including Florida, because of course, Florida, Massachusetts, New York, Texas. Duncan's spiked website also has a locator uh, for grocery, convenience, and liquor stores that are selling these canned beverages. The Duncan name will certainly help it stand out in the hard tea category, which is dominated by Twisted Tea, which is made by Boston Beer Company. Notably, Twisted Tea is now the beer's company's largest brand. Notably, Twisted Tea, I found this surprising, is now the beer company's largest brand, surpassing Truly, which has seen its popularity fade, and Sam Adams. So they are now selling more Twisted Tea than Sam Adams beer at the Boston Beer Company. However, Duncan might find the hard coffee category more challenging. It isn't as popular as some of the other hard drinks. There are only a smattering of brands on sale, like espresso martinis from Kahlua, a jarred cocktail from Beam Centauri's On the Rocks, and a drink called Loverboy. Not familiar with this. Mm-hmm. A canned cocktail from some of the stars 
of Summer House on Bravo. Apparently, they have gotten into this game. Some of the bigger competitors in this sector have failed, but Duncan is Duncan after all. So they have high hopes over there, Jill, for the starting your day and ending your day with Duncan. Just don't confuse it, because like I feel like if you if you if you if you had a really tough night of sleep, you might accidentally drink the alcoholic beverage in the morning, and I don't know if that's going to work for you. The problem is, is that I think there's a lot of caffeine in the coffee one as well. So even if you want to end your day with an alcoholic beverage, do you want to end it with a caffeinated alcoholic beverage? I made a rule a long time ago that no caffeine after 3 p.m. if I can help it, because otherwise it just totally messes with my sleep. The other day when I was at WeWork, I was drinking coffee at 6.30 p.m. as a... <laughs> As we were recording the podcast and you and Red remember, were like, yes. what is up with you? And I'm like, I have a long drive home. I've got two kids. There's no way I'm going to have trouble falling asleep when I get there. So, All right. I, but we yeah. should but we should note you drank uh, non-alcoholic coffee <laughs> Correct. at the office. It, yes. It was just straight coffee with a little half and half. Okay, Mosh, this is my favorite story of the day from the New York Times style section. What is Ijbal, spelled I-J-B-O-L? This new acronym is replacing LOL, R-O-F-L on social media. Gen Zers are increasingly using Ijbal, which stands for... Drum roll. <laughs> I just burst out laughing. So first, <laughs> so first there was LOL, Laugh Out Loud, an acronym that first appeared in the 1980s and became Wait, the is that old? LOL? I, I guess so. And became the reigning LOL, shorthand. LOL, Larry. LOL. Remember that Curb <laughs> episode? Um, it became the reigning shorthand online for what people found funny. Then came ROFL, rolling on the floor laughing. Personally, I never used that one because it seemed insane. Like I've never rolled on the floor laughing. <laughs> Jill's L a very literal acronym person. I am. And then even yeah. LMAO laughing my ass off. I, I wasn't big on that one either. Where you, I've never seen you use it. I'm much. not an LMAO guy. Frankly, I'm not any of these. <laughs> I'm over three. I'm a ha ha. I'm oh. a ha ha guy. Joel. Okay, the thing is, most people type these terms straight-faced, relegating them to dull punctuation added carelessly to the end of a message. So now the internet wants to revitalize laughing online with this new term. It's not necessarily novel or different from how other iterations of internet laughter are used, but it describes something that people actually do, which is explode into an audible, full-belly laugh and it homes in on this type of laugh that may come at an inappropriate or untimely <laughs> setting. Like the New York funeral. Times really going deep here. They're, the New York Times really going deep here, Jill. Like this is quite a write up. Well, this is the reason it spoke to me because I because I tend to laugh at inappropriate times. Like yeah. during this podcast, when I just cannot ever control myself. Um, but again, uh, Mosh, the reason I wanted to include this today is because one, we at Mo News want to make sure everyone's in the know when it comes to trends. And two, because again, I personally have struggled with this. Uh, as you know, I am a laugher and yep. I do tend to IJBOL or Ijbal burst out laughing. And up until now, when I burst out laughing, I write, Literally LOL'd, okay? Mm. But I like Ishbal -L -L better. LOL, -L -L -L, but you're going with Ishbal. I'd like to thank Generation Z here uh, for coming up with this. It sounds like Jill is going to adopt it, uh, despite not being of the generation. Uh, but <laughs> it looks like it's going to take Not even here, close. At least on the podcast. Uh, and by the way, I can attest to all of this. I was like, Jill, this is a serious story coming up. we got to cut the laughter and move on to something serious. So the New York Times story here continues that for Gen Zers, this seems like a timely replacement. They quote a 127-year-old, which is elder Gen Z, out of Australia, who is quoted as saying, I don't LMAO. It's just not what I do. I associate, I associate LMAO with millennial humor, but then I associate Ijbol with Gen Z humor, which is funnier. Whoa, challenge accepted, Gen Z. <laughs> Though apparently here the acronym Ishbol was first entered into Urban Dictionary in 09. Remember Urban Dictionary? I haven't been there in a while, but apparently it's been there 
for since 09. What is that? 14 years. And they say now that the unofficial face of Ijbol, according to Twitter, is Vice President Kamala Harris. Harris, and we've put some of the clips, is known, uh, has a reputation for chuckling, unprompted, sometimes at some weird moments in interviews. Uh, they say injecting levity. Some people say injecting nervousness. Though to our <laughs> knowledge, Vice President Harris has not used the term Ijbol, and many fear if she does, it'll lose its edge. Uh, it won't be as cool as Gen Z wants it to be. So Gen Z challenging us, millennials, Though I think you're an exennial, Jill, sort of Gen X. Uh, I think we've determined you're somewhere between X and millennial. Way um, to blow I like up to my claim spot, <laughs> <laughs> um, Gen Z, Ishbol, is going to be adopted by us on this podcast. We might use it in the future. Uh, listeners, let me know, Jill. I'm actually going to run a survey over on the Instagram account today to get a, people, to get a sense of how people feel about Ishbol. Are they into it? Are they not into it? Do they think there's a better acronym? Do they think Gen Z has, you know, done something here? Is this a New York Times story about Gen Z that Gen Z actually agrees with? Because that also happens. The media determines there's a trend based on someone's kid at the New York Times, and it's not actually a trend. So we're gonna we're gonna dive into this. Rest assured, in the coming days. My favorite part of it, though, is that they say that if Kamala Harris were to ever use Ishval, like that would be the end of it. And that is part of what I fear about us starting to use it, or at least me starting to use it. It's like <laughs> as soon as it gets on the Mo News podcast, as Jill Wagner got her hands on it, it's done. No longer cool. <laughs> it's big in the Long Island mom community. <laughs> <laughs> it's big at school pickup. All right, let's go to On This Day in History. We're going to begin in 1896. Today marks the day that a guy named George Carmack reportedly spotted gold nuggets in a creek in Alaska, leading to the Klondike fever, the gold rush of Alaska. This was the last great gold rush of the American West. Carmack, by the way, would get rich. He would leave the Yukon with $1 million worth of gold, and that was 120 years ago. So that was worth a lot back then. Many gold miners in the Klondike eventually sold their stakes to mining companies. Large-scale mining would run through the 1960s. The region would yield apparently more than $200 million in gold. Today, there are still some miners looking for some gold up there. All right. On this day in 1954, the first issue of Sports Illustrated was released. The weekly publication, later changed to monthly, uh, became the leading sports magazine in America. Interestingly, the creator of Time magazine, a guy by the name of Henry Luce, was not actually a sports fan. But by the early 1950s, he believed that America deserved a weekly sports magazine. And although many of his advisors said, sports is frivolous, not important, don't get involved in it, he said, we should create Sports Illustrated. And there you have it, the history of SI. All right, on this day in 1973, I found this notable, just given what we're going through today. On this day, 50 years ago, President Nixon gave a televised address calling the Watergate investigation a witch hunt, proclaiming his innocence just about a year later, he would resign, saying the whole thing was a distraction to the nation, and he didn't want to put the nation through it. Just thought it was interesting. And actually, I think I'll do a deep dive over on the Instagram account on the term witch hunt. All right, a bit of music history. On this day in 1977, Elvis Presley died of a heart attack brought on by years of drug abuse. He was only 42 years old. Notably, on this day, we also lost Jill Aretha Franklin on this day in 2018 at the age of 76. A bit of more uplifting news to send you out on. 24 years ago on this day, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, hosted by Regis Philbin, premiered on ABC, A Cultural Moment, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, was one of the highest rated shows in primetime for years there over on ABC. Mosh, I can safely say that if I were to be a contestant on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, you would be my phone a friend. A hundred percent. That's quite an honor, Jill. I hope uh, I hope the category, I feel like Meredith Vieira was hosting it for a while. I don't know who hosts it today. I feel like it's still on somewhere out there, but it is quite an honor. Jill, I actually had a game show experience. Uh, the show was called Cash Cab. Some people might be familiar with it, where literally you get in a cab and it turns out to be a game show cab and the driver is asking you questions until you get to the destination. I happened to be in it in Tel Aviv 14 years ago on Israeli Cash Cab. <laughs> and they had a similar phone, a friend. And I called my friend Toby. And uh, the question was at the time, where was Rihanna born? And uh, he answered it. 
Uh, and we ended up winning, I think, a couple thousand shekel at the time, probably a couple hundred bucks. But I do know that if I was on that show again today and that came up as the question, I would most certainly call you as my phone friend. <laughs> Anything Rihanna, Beyonce maybe, or Taylor Swift, yes. I'm your girl. Uh, I actually always thought those things were somewhat staged. So you literally just got into a cab and it was like, surprise, you're on oh, this game yeah. show? I- I literally like tried to flag down a cab. You get in and all these lights turn on. (laughs) That was a genuine surprise. Now I will tell you at the end of Cash Cab, at least the way they shot it there, we got out of the cab. The driver hands you like a pile of cash. The camera turns off. They take the cash back from you because they're like, (laughs) now we need you to sign a bunch of documents. That that is really fascinating, Mosh. That could be one of your, if you ever play Two Truths and a Lie, I feel like (laughs) you should throw that in there. And finally, Jill, we go out on one of my favorite songs, uh, Out This Day, turning 47 years old, came out in 1976, ABBA's Dancing Queen. All right, we want to thank you for listening to the Mo News podcast. If you like what you hear, share this with your friends. Uh, We'd really appreciate it. It will help us grow, and it might make you look smart. Follow us and subscribe so you don't miss an episode, and review us in the App Store. See you later, everybody.